Thank you. Um, let's see if we can get this going. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for this uh, invitation to present and, and share um, thoughts with you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the AOS syndrome and what to do about it. And I just want to preface uh, my talk by saying uh, I'm not proposing that we're going to do away with it. It's very much um, alive and, and well. What I'm going to propose is that we look at it with more granularity um, to um, to to understand better um, what um, what is going on um, and how people um, deal with their um, impairments to still produce speech, um, as well as what um, what clinicians can do um, as they're faced with a, um, the the task of differentially diagnosing this disorder. Uh, I um, would like to um, acknowledge uh, our collaborators at the UNC CAR lab um, and at the Profiles Project, that's an, which is an ongoing project um, where we are um, trying to solve some of these uh, problems with the AOS uh, diagnose, diagnosis quantitatively. Um, also, um, very appreciative of, of collaborators um, everywhere. The outline for the talk is where you, I'm going to start out by talking about the AOS syndrome uh, briefly, what it is, and then we will jump straight into three dimensions of the behavioral, <clears throat> excuse me, the behavioral syndrome of AOS, um, uh, those being phonemic errors, segmental distortions, and uh, word prosody. And I'll explain why these are uh, important um, and some of the things we've been doing in the lab and why we we have been doing these kinds of things. And then we will have some conclusions uh, in terms of theory and practice and hopefully some great discussion after that. So what apraxia of speech is, it is defined as a motor planning or perhaps a motor programming disorder. Um, so it is a conceptual definition. It is not something that we can directly observe. There's never any way to directly verify whether uh, a person has this motor pl planning or motor programming disorder independently of their speech production, at least not yet. Um, and also we're still working um, hard to try to figure out uh, what motor planning and what uh, motor programming entails uh, through theoretical development. So what we do is we diagnose this disorder as a behavioral syndrome. Um, and so a syndrome is a collection of recognizable traits that occur together um, and for some specific reason to, to tell us something important. And for a Praxia of speech, we have uh, various checklists that have been used over time. And one of the big problems, as we all know, with this diagnosis is that the criteria have evolved over time um, and uh, different labs and different clinicians might uh, uh, use different checklists. Um, I'm going to be uh, uh, focusing on the diagnostic criteria that were used in um, treatment evidence-based reviews, um, and I'll, start, uh, I'll specifically focus on the one from 2006 by Wamba and colleagues. Um, so we will look at those first uh, four uh, criteria, um, and then mention a little bit briefly the fifth criteria of consistency or inconsistency that is no longer used. The problem then with diagnosing apraxia of speech is that it is one of these disorders that um, does not have a gold standard. And to define what we mean by a gold standard, we mean a test that is able to determine whether a patient does or does not have the specific condition. And in our case, the specific condition is impaired motor planning or programming. So there simply is no way to verify the accuracy of a diagnosis. And therefore we cannot say that we have a gold standard. 
Instead, what we have is we may have practice standards um, or reference standards to which we compare um, alternative assessment uh, approaches, for example. And in our field, the reference standard and the clinical standard is clinical impression. So for most research studies, uh, we use an expert-based reference standard, meaning that uh, we trust clinicians who have um, seen a lot of these cases, who have developed a gestalt impression um, of what they believe the syndrome entails, and then um, we um, rely on this impression. Um, and the assumption is that the um, the uh, diagnostician is using uh, pattern recognition so that they're recognizing um, the syndrome as they encounter it. Um, but again, um, we're trusting experts and we're trusting uh, their judgment, but we really have no way to um, check for validity to verify accuracy. Um, in our lab, we have um, also relied on this uh, reference standard approach many times, but we have also mostly used um, converging um, evidence and multiple measures, multiple clinical measures to, um, to tackle the issue. Um, now, granted, this is growing over time, and we have started with few measures, and we're adding more and more to them, but the whole idea is that we will look for converging evidence that what we see in our patients um, conform to what we believe the syndrome is. So, for example, if we have a checklist of, of, of criteria, we want to know are those symptoms actually present in the speech, or is it just um, some overall impression that uh, may not really reflect reality? So we want to um, go in, uh, in and, and measure those things and gradually build um, constellations of what occurs together and what does not occur together. Before we get um, into the studies, um, I want to just mention about the differentiation. So what is it that is difficult in terms of the differential diagnosis of apraxia of speech? Um, it really matters <laughs> what the context is. So um, sometimes um, the diagnosis is fairly easy and sometimes it's quite hard. So um, we have these colorful um, um, visuals here for you to see, and you can decide where you, you are on this spectrum in general. I, some, some of us or some people are more um, um, assertive, perhaps, or more feel more competent in diagnosing a proxy of speech, and others are more um, hesitant. So wherever you are. But I do want to make the argument that there's certain things that are pretty easy. So if we're looking at the green side here, where things are fairly easy, um, differentiating between aphasia and apraxia of speech is not hard because aphasia is a language disorder and apraxia of speech is a speech disorder. So knowing that aphasia is a language disorder, if we see problems um, in other modalities besides um, speech, those affecting speech sounds, um, so in syntax, uh, in lexical retrieval, in other um, domains like um, uh, writing uh, and reading, um, those are things that would be indicative of aphasia um, for, and apraxia of speech as a speech uh, disorder. Uh, now, where this can get tricky sometimes is when um, the disorders are mild. So, for example, if the aphasia is really mild, a person may are fairly mild, they, they, they might score within normal limits, for example, on the Western aphasia battery, uh, but yet um, have significant uh, difficulties uh, that they experience personally and that may be revealed through things like discourse uh, analysis. Uh, but in general, that distinction is, is, is not so hard to make clinically. Now, moving down to the orange here on the bottom, what is hard to do in terms of differentiating aphasia and apraxia of speech is to differentiate aphasia with phonemic paraphasia specifically from aphasia with apraxia of speech. So to know whether those sound errors and the speech difficulties that are occurring are um, um, should be uh, 
uh, classified as phonemic paraphasia, more a phonological problem versus apraxia of speech, more of a motor problem. That is very difficult to do. Similarly with dysarthria versus apraxia of speech, that's fairly easy to do for, mo for most dysarthria types in that if we're looking for other um, subsystems besides articulation, uh, we find that there are phonatory differences, there are um, velopharyngeal um, signs of, of, of weakness or, or, or um, um, other motor execution difficulties. Uh, and uh, with apraxia of speech, uh, we don't typically see those. Uh, now, um, where it is really difficult is when we're trying to differentiate apraxia with dysarthria from apraxia without dysarthria, because the dysarthrias that are typically seen with apraxia of speech overlap with many features um, with um, uh, apraxia of speech. So what is what? And what is part of the AOS syndrome? What is part of a coexisting um, dysarthria? That is very, very difficult um, to decide. Um, also, it is easier to make differential diagnosis when you know the patient's history and when you know the patient's uh, presentation. Um, and so you're diagnosing in context. You know um, where whether there's a stroke or is a progressive disease. You know what part of the brain was affected and you know um, the other co coexisting language, cognitive and motor deficits that puts everything in context. Um, so that is always important to consider. Um, I'm going to tell you about this 2012 study really briefly. Um, this is um, a very difficult to diagnose situation that we were writing about. So it's definitely in the orange uh, or maybe even red category here. Um, what we did is we had um, expert diagnosticians who had many years of practice differentiating apraxia of speech from aphasia with phonemic paraphasia. And um, they were um, assigned to listen to um, audio recordings only of 39 people with aphasia post-stroke, some of whom um, had apraxia of speech, some of whom didn't have apraxia of speech. Um, we didn't, um, we didn't uh, assign it in, an, in any specific way, but um, all of them had some kind of speech production difficulties and not just not significant dysarthria at least. Um, so these experienced clinician had, clinicians had never met these patients. They did not know the diagnostic uh, background or the history. Um, they were simply listening to the audio recordings and deciding um, whether they um, thought the person had apraxia of speech or not. And we also used this possible apraxia of speech category. And what we found was that perfect agreement among all three of them uh, depressingly only occurred for 26% of the sample. Um, we also did perceptual scaling as, as part of this um, study and concluded that um, it was um, not um, perfect, um, in terms of reliability, but that quantitative measures of the same dimensions had really strong um, reliability. And our conclusion was that we need to use both. And this is something that I'm going to um, return to in the conclusions. Now, one of the things about the study that is, is sort of buried in, in the results is um, the um, uh, the degree to which the three clinicians decided um, uh, on AOS versus no AOS. So there were three raters, um, and you can see here that rater B was one of those clinicians who, who just did the dichotomy, either um, confident that the person had a proxy of speech or confident that the person did not have a proxy of speech. And this person's base rate of a proxy of speech was um, fairly high, so the expectation that a lot of these people would have a proxy of speech. Uh, in comparison, Rader C, which much was much more conservative in assigning um, the um, their proxy of speech diagnosis, 
and uh, both raters A and C um, lean more um, towards uh, including um, a fairly large proportion of uncertainty. So these clinicians worked in different clinical settings. Um, they did not work together. They had different experiences. All were using the same criteria for diagnosis, but they had different experiences with, um, with patient populations and had not therefore synchronized their judgments in terms of um, uh, in, in terms of how often they um, would um, assign a diagnosis of apraxia of speech, among other things. And I think that's really, really important. Um, had they been working together, um, their um, expectations would have been um, more similar, presumably, and they would have a, had greater agreement. The other thing um, um, that we're um, noticing is that the 26% agreement, you know, perhaps these are more prototypical examples of the AOS syndrome. And I would draw your attention to um, our aphasia syndromes. Like we have for a long time accepted that aphasia syndromes are, um, they're behavioral syndromes and they're very heterogeneous and our traditional categories um, uh, don't always overlap uh, across clinicians and certainly not, not across different aphasia batteries. Um, they're different, um, expectations for uh, what considered what is considered to be a good profile. Um, so here um, is a study that was just published last week where we were looking at, um, at 195 people with chronic um, aphasia. And um, they were doing a motor speech evaluation and we then coded phonemic errors, segmental distortions and word prosody for these people. Um, and we have plotted this in a three dimensional graph. Um, I told you that we like to do things operationally and quantitatively often in our research and you see that represented here. So on the bottom, you see a whole bunch of black dots. Those black dots represent people who have aphasia, but they don't produce a lot of anemic errors. Um, so we call them aphasia with minimal speech production errors. Um, and then you have the red dots. These are people who, who meet quantitative criteria as stated for the behavioral syndrome of apraxia of speech. So they have long um, average uh, du syllable durations in multisyllabic words, and they produce a lot of phonemic distortions. And then you have the green, which is uh, when people have short uh, or normal syllable durations and few distortion errors. Um, so we see that there's quite a bit of heterogeneity in these two syndromes, and then we have also plotted some blue dots in between here, where we um, uh, found that based on our criteria, um, there was a mix of results. So there were long syllable durations, perhaps with few distortion errors, or short syllable durations with a lot of distortion errors. So we call that the borderline group. And so what I want you um, to appreciate from this is that um, it's no wonder it's difficult to differ differentiate the, um, these uh, syndromes on a case-by-case -case basis. If you're looking at the clinical heterogeneity that, that we see here and you're following um, these main criteria for differential diagnosis, even when we quantify them systematically, um, there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of heterogeneity and there are patients who are not prototypical. So that does speak against this typical like rigid dichotomy of either you have a praxia of speech or you don't have a praxia of speech. So um, I'm getting into the different dimensions now. So I'll uh, start with the perceived phonemic errors. So you might wonder why are we measuring phonemic errors because that's not listed as a criterion for apraxia of speech. Well, it is because people who have apraxia of speech as well as people who have phonemic paraphasia, they produce phonemic errors. And the phonemic errors are um, the errors that are influencing their daily life and reducing their intelligibility and making it difficult for them um, to, um, to live their lives um, um, 
in the capacity that they wish to live. Um, and they, they struggle a lot to be accurate um, and to be um, understood. So uh, for treatment purposes, it seems really, really important that we focus on these errors that are of a magnitude that they actually change listeners' perception. So instead of hearing the intended words, they hear another word, since a phoneme is the smallest unit of speech that distinguishes one word from another. It's a per perceptual unit. Um, also, <clears throat> um, uh, we are interested in differentiating this minimal group from the rest, right? Um, so here is a study uh, where we just present some, um, some strategies for quantifying phonemic errors. If you do a phonetic transcription, you get a string of symbols. As long as you have a symbol per phoneme, you can um, use the Levenstein um, edit distance uh, to calculate the um, uh, percent uh, or the number of um, phonemic errors. And this just shows that it corresponds really well to manual, much more labor intensive cal calculations. Um, and this, as well as some, some other um, measures that we're developing and automating are available on our website, aphasia.unc.edu. And all of you are welcome to. Um, um, talk to us about those and, and use them. We are working hard to add more um, resources there. One thing that has we have known ever since Bloomston did her study, um, dissertation study on, um, on phonemic errors in aphasia is that people who have a profile of apraxia of speech in general produce more phonemic errors than people who have a profile of aphasia with phonemic paraphasia. So here we're looking at um, conduction aphasia, especially, but also Wernicke aphasia in particular. Um, this is kind of, um, uh, it's interesting because aphasia with phonemic paraphasia specifically is about phonemic uh, paraphasias. But um, of course, this just helps remind us that phonemes are our perceptions of listeners. We are, of course, not measuring the underlying process that are producing these errors. But we have to consider, like, what does this mean for our, our research? Because in every study, almost every study that we have conducted and that many others have conducted, we find the same difference in severity. So if we're comparing a proxy of speech um, to aphasia with phonemic paraphasia, or even maybe a combination of those with minimal aphasia um, production difficulties and a proxy of speech, almost everything we look at is going to have a quantitative difference between the two just because there are more errors in a proxy of speech and for our purposes in a proxy of speech usually it's not interesting for us to study those with minimal um, production difficulties which is of course why we use this term aphasia with phonemic paraphasia um, so I have a couple of studies I'm going to share with you. We're doing a whole bunch of stuff on phonetic transcription, looking at the patterns um, of phonemic um, uh, changes. And um, I'm excited to, to share some of the things that will come out in the future on that. Here, I'm just going to um, remind you guys, and maybe just put it in context, the, this whole issue of sequential consistency was something that we worked on for a while in the lab. Um, this is that when you say um, words several times, so you say the word catastrophe, we typically have people say it five times, catastrophe, catastrophe, catastrophe. We notice that there are um, changes from um, attempt to attempt, uh, but a diagnostic criterion said that we were supposed to look for errors that were consistent in terms of location and invariable in terms of type. And the original evidence from uh, for that came from this specific task. So um, I am not going to um, talk about this in detail, but here is a sequence of studies um, that uh, brought us closer and closer to uh, a firm decision. We looked at different aspects of consistency and variability and um, finally came to the conclusion that this is something you see both in apraxia of speech and in aphasia. Um, and if anything, if you see it, um, it tends to be the case that it's more variable, more inconsistent in apraxia of speech, 
But the problem is it's very closely related to frequency of error, which brings us back to that whole issue of balancing um, the, uh, the number of errors that people make. We have recently um, uh, completed a study looking then at, well, so uh, we have this variability, but is it is are there differences in in how people are able to uh, perhaps self-correct? Um, so if you're saying the word five times, do you get better with time? Um, and, or do you get worse or does it not change? Does it depend on your um, diagnosis? So, in this case, there are different colors. Uh, sorry about that, but we had 133 participants and they were saying these four words uh, five times. And we are now not looking at consistency measures, but we're looking at uh, phonetic or phonemic accuracy. And what we find is that they all get worse. Now, the aphasia only group here. Um, is um, more looks more stable. There was no significant difference among them, and you can see in all groups that there's there's a ceiling effect in that most people produce um, them accurately. But nevertheless, we see a deterioration over time here. Um, and so, in interpreting that, we have considered that to be um, because saying words five times in a in a row is not a normal way of speaking it detaches you from the actual meaning of words as you go um, so you get semantic satiation and it's really resembles like a tongue twister type of paradigm where, where you've seen sim similar results for neurotypical speakers who are asked to say difficult uh, words and sentences over and over and over again that they get worse over time so our conclusion is that this uh, is one of those um, things we do in a motor speech evaluation that uh, it's, it, it, it helps us um, find errors in people who are quite mild. Uh, we have other studies um, that are, are coming out as, as, as I mentioned. So um, just, um, I'm not going to, um, to give you more about that other than to say that I feel like phonemic errors are really, really important functionally um, and for us to start to understand treatment um, strategies. Next, I'm going to talk about segmental distortions because this is something that is a, as a criterion for apraxia of speech. And what are they? Um, often we feel like, you know, maybe we know uh, intuitively what a distortion is, but like it's something that's not clear, but um, not 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 exactly right. Um, so when you look at the literature, what you find is that when people are actually they're coding this, they um, describe it as is it's not a phonemic error. It doesn't change. Um, the meaning of words. It doesn't have the capacity to change the meaning of words, but it doesn't sound quite right. The problem with apraxia of speech is that it's not consistently always like a, a frictionalization or an undershoot. It's like all kinds of different um, errors that are occurring. Um, if we uh, look at it acoustically, um, we can see that um, there are definite signs that it, it looks like it's messy. <laughs> so there are many uh, um, or several studies that have been uh, conducted in this area. I'm showing you an example from a study uh, way back um, 20 years ago where um, we were having uh, people uh, say words that started with sh or words that started with s. Um, so on the top, you have the neurotypical, one neurotypical speaker on the bottom, you have a person with apraxia of speech. Now they said things like sue and shoe, it was part of many other words all mixed up, and they said it um, 24 times each for the, the two um, targets. And then we looked at uh, the spectrum over time. So sh has a lower spectrum um, than um, s, and we quantified it as a spectral mean. Uh, which you see 
plotted on the on the vertical axis and then, and then on the horizontal axis you have time so i want you to notice how distinct and clear and 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 consistent the neurotypical speakers are they truly are each one has a different um uh, way of speaking so that the exactly where the resonance is for um, S and SH varies from speaker to speaker, but they're all very, very uh, consistent in saying these words repeatedly. On the bottom, you see our people, uh, this one person with apraxia of speech, and you can just feel like this is distorted. Um, it is, um, it's variable, it's, it's, it's there, but it's not quite there. So look, for example, at the shot, this is 100% perceived as shh but it's not uh, a very precise production of sh. S is produced as, um, uh, heard as S 92% of the time, and it has even more errors. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at some of these um, acoustic um, ways to quantify distortions, but we didn't want to just go out and do what was easy to do. We wanted to understand what are the kinds of distortions that people make. And so we have spent many years um, doing this with highly, highly trained um, transcribers, lots of time investment in, tra in uh, training these transcribers. And we, we started with a very, very comprehensive um, set of um, uh, diacritic marks and our um, assumption was that when you use the diacritic mark, you would use it to indicate that the, there was a distortion present. Um, and we decided to use these very specific diacritic marks because the psychology of listening to disordered speech can trick you sometimes into thinking that you're hearing a distortion when what you're hearing is unintelligible speech or speech that is unusual. So it has a lot of unexpected sequences of, of phonemes and your brain is processing this as, whoa, this is, this is a lot. Um, and you're um, uh, not specifically deciding that this is something I hear as a different phoneme versus this is something that's a clear phoneme with something that's a little bit off right so we felt like that was really important um and then with the way that we did the transcription is that we had to teach our transcribers as best we could to not respond to dialectal variation or to other normal allophonic variations like coarticulatory variations and only use the diacritic marks when there was a something that uh, was um, perceived as a disordered. So we've done several studies um, on this. This is one study I'll share with you um, where we were actually using clinical diagnosis of apraxia of speech. We did that in collaboration with Julie Wombo's lab, 24 participants who were diagnosed with um, aphasia and apraxia of speech. All 24 of them were clinically diagnosed with, with that. Um, they repeated 27 words. We did narrow phonetic transcription um, and we plotted then the segments affected. Um, and you can see the black dots are distortion errors and the um, open dots are distorted substitution errors. So distorted substitution errors are um, actually a combination of distorted substitution or um, addition error. So there's a phonological error. And then on top of that same segment, there's also something that you hear that's it's not quite right. And we uh, found that we found that both in other studies, we found that both are more common in the proxy of speech profiles than in aphasia with phonemic paraphasia or just aphasia profiles. But we find that um, there are very few segments that are actually um, transcribable as both a specific phonemic error and a distortion error on top of that. Um, so we have done this in stroke uh, in several studies. Here's a study. Um, where we extended um, the um, question to, um, to progressive aphasia. So we were looking at people with um, primary progressive aphasia. 10 of them had a non-fluent primary progressive aphasia. All of them had apraxia of speech. Uh, 10 had a logopenic variant uh, primary progressive aphasia. 
All of them did not have apraxia of speech. And we also had five with a semantic variant, primary progressive aphasia. And when I say they had apraxia of speech or they did not, that was based on um, clinical impression by expert um, listeners and diagnosticians. Uh, so we had a couple of different methods. So we used the motor speech evaluation and we did narrow phonetic transcription of that. We also had connected speech uh, from the picnic um, scene from the Western aphasia battery and we did narrow phonetic transcription of that. Uh, for the connected speech, we obviously didn't uh, transcribe everything that the person said, but we transcribed all of the content words that had anything other than a perfect production. Um, and then we um, uh, looked at the results. So we wanted to compare the two diagnostic groups, but we also wanted to compare the samples that we used. And so here we're expressing distortions by word so that we can com compare the two samples more easily. So it's not by segment as before, it's by word. Um, and so we can see that statistically there are more distortion errors um, in the low, in the uh, non-fluent variant PPA group who also the, who also had a proxy of speech than in the the other two groups. Uh, but there's overlap, and interestingly enough, that overlap disappears when we get to connected speech, uh, and or it diminishes, I should say. So the distinction is much more clear in connected speech. There are fewer errors, but there there's a clear difference between the two. Um, and uh, uh, we're looking at um, reasons for that. Um, and also um, we found that um, the, these differences uh, in samples wasn't only for distortion errors, but also for prosodic errors. Okay, so now we come back to the original reason that we wanted to look at distortion errors with this really fine-grained analysis tool being narrow phonetic transcription, is we wanted to find out what kind of distortion errors do people make so that we can figure out how to quantify them acoustically, perhaps, or um, with some other very targeted perceptual training. Um, and so we find a very similar pattern across studies, whether it's progressive uh, apraxia of speech or it is stroke-induced apraxia of speech. Um, we find that there's a lot of errors in length. Um, there's a lot of errors in voicing. There are tongue um, position errors. Um, both for vowels and for consonants, and then there are manner errors. And you have them, um, the most common ones um, um, listed down on the bottom. So remember, we started from this potential distortions of 30 something different uh, categories and distilled it to about 10. So these are the things that we're going to be focusing on. Now, these are people here who are probably probable. Uh, AOS, either uh, progressive or stroke induced. So we, what about the people who have probable just aphasia or probable aphasia with phonemic paraphasia? And it looks the same. <laughs> so they have far fewer of these errors, but the distribution uh, is the same. Um, so now I'm going to be finally, um, to conclude here, I'll uh, talk about word prosody. Uh, so prosody is an interesting thing. We know that it is, um, it has always been, or for a very long time, it has been known to be a, um, a sign of apraxia of speech. So they have impaired prosody or prosodic abnormalities. Sometimes it's thought to be at least partially a response to the difficulties with the articulation in the person attempting with greater effort to be more precise um, and struggling with their um, their their planning. Um, uh, and sometimes it's it's thought to be just a main core feature of the disorder that's part of the whole motor programming uh, planning. Um, uh, mechanism that's impaired. Uh, we also talk about the rate being slow and the way that it's slow in apraxia of speech. It's not just slow overall, but um, it is um, different from other slownesses in that the there's lengthened segments 
Um, we saw some of that in the distortion results previously, but there, there are lengthened segments of vowels and other continuance. Um, and there are also intersegment pauses that are way longer than normal. Um, so if we look at prosody, prosody is defined as supersegmental. So it's not what's happening at the segmental level, it's what, ha what happens across several segments. Um, typically, when we define prosody, we consider rhythm and tempo, stress, and intonation. Um, so far in English, at least, there has not been very good evidence that um, uh, intonation is impaired in the praxis of speech. But rhythm and tempo is definitely um, impaired and stress um, is also um, affected. So we can talk about this as aspects of temporal uh, prosody. And my question mark here is just that um, it doesn't seem like the only thing that would be in addition to rhythm and tempo differences might be stress. And stress is primarily um, abnormal in apraxia of speech as far as we can tell in, in the duration domain rather than the um, um, pitch um, differences uh, or, or intensity differences. So um, it's important to, I think, to do more research to really understand quantitatively what do we mean by prosodic abnormalities. We have used a very pragmatic approach to this because we know that multisyllabic words are always hard for, for folks to have apraxia of speech. Um, and um, it uh, makes them prolong segments. It makes them insert pauses within the multisyllabic words, words that have three or more syllables. And so um, we feel like that's the perfect way to express uh, word uh, prosody. Um, here's what we do. We just simply measure the duration of a word. Um, and then we uh, identify the number of syllables produced and we uh, calculate the ratio, express that in milliseconds. So here's a normal speaker saying television, 178 milliseconds is very normal. Um, a person with apraxia of speech might use 400 milliseconds um, to, to say this word. Uh, what we do, like these duration measure is easy to do um, automatically. Um, finding how many syllables are produced have so far we have been using human listeners to decide how many syllables are produced so it doesn't take that much time to do but it it does take some time um, to do this manual processing um it is helpful to differentiate a proxy of speech from uh, aphasia and aphasia with phonemic paraphasia Here's a study um, where we were looking at speech samples from nine people who um, had um, uh, aphasia and no apraxia of speech, seven people who had, um, no, <laughs> seven people who had aphasia with apraxia of speech, sorry about that typo, and then 19 neurotypical. And the, the way we did the diagnosis was um, Dr. Jackson and I were in perfect uh, agreement about uh, this. And uh, they produced nine multisyllabic words. And then we looked at word syllable duration and we looked at the pairwise variability index uh, in terms of duration. And here are the results for the word syllable duration. Don't worry about the different clusters here where we're looking at some vowel effects, but we have a praxy of speech here, long word syllable durations, aphasia only, short, similar to neurotypical controls. Um, here is the pairwise variability index. There are differences among the groups, uh, um, statistically significant differences, but um, there's greater overlap between the groups. Finally, before I get to my conclusions, I want to return to this, this issue of uh, measuring duration quantitatively. So, uh, Doing the uh, placement of markers around, acoustically around a word, doing it repeatedly, listening to how many syllables you hear is not hard. We have excellent reliability on it, but it is difficult if you're processing hundreds or, th or thousands of, um, of um, utterances. And it's 
always too much for practicing clinicians. So we wanted to see if we could develop some automated ways of doing this. Um, and we also wanted to know where's the cutoff for word syllable duration, like what is normal? Um, 178 is definitely normal, 400 is definitely abnormal, but where is the cutoff? So um, we're working on developing norms for this. Um, this is a paper that's currently under review, um, and it's part of a study that's looking at large samples. So, so far we've included 50 neurotypical participants who produced 49 words, and we measured word syllable duration both manually and automatically. And so the, our chosen method to do this automatically was to use IBM Watson um, ASR uh, um, speech recognition um, that was then linked um, to uh, a lexicon um, where we could uh, identify the number of syllables uh, uh, connected with the word that the ASR recognized. So we didn't have to use a normal um, a listener for that. And we decided that the mean uh, plus 1.64 standard deviations corresponding to the 95th percentile, percentile might be a reasonable cutoff uh, for what to consider to be abnormal. So here you can see uh, in orange here, we have a stroke sample. This is our sample of 195 people with stroke aphasia. And we know that some of them have apraxia of speech. Um, and you can see the word syllable duration there on the vertical axis, that it ranges from um, 150 or 60 something to 800 something. So uh, a great range of here. And how do we know which of these um, two um, that have abnormal um, word syllable duration? So we did the study, uh, we did both manual measures and then we did the automated measures and we distilled these results so far. Uh, for our neurotypical speakers, uh, we have a uh, cutoff with our standards there at 301 milliseconds. And this is really interesting because in most studies we have, you know, I told you we've used these operational criteria, quantitative criteria. We typically use the median and we just split our sample in half. And that corresponds up to around 300 milliseconds. So it's interesting just by chance we have been using, it seems a, a cutoff that's pretty, uh, pretty good. The automation is not complete. Uh, what we find is that Watson in their typical speakers uh, identifies the correct number of syllables with very high precision, even if Watson um, identifies the wrong words or they hear one word as three words or something. It's still the correct number of syllables, which, which gives us hope for a stroke. Um, the problem uh, we're running into is that the boundaries um, for words that you get with IBM Watson are they're padded and they don't exactly correspond to where the word boundaries are so we still have to work that out but our intent is to make this uh, feasible for um, automate full automation all right so the conclusions here um, is uh, we have this um, scattering of uh, multidimensionality that occurs in clinical practice. And what are we going to do with it? Uh, in terms of research, we would like to propose um, that we just accept that categorical classifications are imprecise approximation of reality. Um, they're a good first step when you're starting a science and a medical diagnostic inquiry to, to group people. But the reality is that there's more complexity to it. And there's more complexity uh, that will potentially be really helpful to help us understand what programming and planning of speech production is um, and what it is uh, under impaired conditions uh, when a person is producing and planning speech without the full circuitry. Um, that's a norm, neurotypical speaker has. So if we embrace this um, notion of a spectra, a multidimensional spectrum uh, and several dimensions, I talked about three, there's probably more. We can look both at precise constellations and we can of like 
prototypical um, profiles, and we can look at more broad categories. Um, we need to add more psychometrically um, sound metrics um, to our arsenal. And when we have this, we can also begin to explore statistically um, the underlying structure, for example, through principal component analysis um, to see what goes with what and uh, what uh, predicts what. Uh, we also feel like it's really important to broaden the scope of features to the dysarthrias, which coexists with the praxis of speech, so that we can capitalize more of the voice changes and the velopharyngeal resonance changes, um, and um, to consider dynamic assessment, where um, it's not just about the speech itself; it's about how the context affects the speech. Might give us uh, might, might give us some important clues about how speech is planned and programmed. And then in terms of clinical uh, practice, um, what we want to say is that the clinicians, as I said in, in the beginning, clinically, you have context. So you have the medical history, you have the brain imaging often, you have the evolution of, sign, of the symptoms and experiences that you use as an experienced clinicians to make predictions. Um, you typically do that from the moment you see a patient, if you're experienced, and then you, you test. We, for praxis of speech, uh, do physical examination. Um, so we look at strength coordination, movements, um, speech, cognition, language. We look at all those um, things um, to develop uh, an impression. Our uh, recommendation is that we continue to do that and we continue to do number four, which is interpretation. We interpret all of this information to uh, make it a, a, a diagnosis, but that we add quantitative testing. Um, and I, I think of speech samples as like analogous to blood samples. Like you, you can get, if you can get quantitative measures, you can get them over time, you see how they change over time, and you can get uh, um, specific indices to look at, to determine whether they um, justify your diagnosis or not. Uh, and also whether perhaps your, um, your case is, is prototypical or not prototypical. And as we are sharing results of our diagnosis with other labs, with other clinicians, that we have an opportunity to analyze um, results in, um, uh, independently. Because so far we've been stuck in this literature with just somebody's um, judgment, somebody's impression, and we have to go with that. And looking at our raters A, B, and C, who were all experienced there in the beginning, you know, we may, we don't know. <laughs> Uh, what their uh, their basis for um, what is enough of a prosodic impairment? What is enough of a distortion to uh, pattern to to use this diagnosis? So we would like to um, um, advocate for justifying your diagnosis, uh, and of course that will also be helpful as diagnostic criteria change over time. So those are my conclusions, and here are um, some references for you. And I am really glad to take um, questions. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Haley. This was wonderful. Thank you. I know all of some of you I'll open up the room first to questions. And I know we have some um, in the chat box. Go ahead if you're in the, in the room and you have some questions, please feel free to type those um, any questions from the room first? Did she hear you from here? I think so. Oh. You can try. Can you hear me from here? Oh, you can walk up, Sarah. You can walk up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. Hello. laughs> um, so I really enjoyed uh, your talk and especially um, your your last presentation of looking at how you automated um, some of that interpretation um, to be able to use for clinical. Um, we've been doing something very similar with um, healthy adults uh, and aging. And two of the tasks that we use, we use one which is a non-word repetition um, and then another one, um, which is uh, the NIH toolbox, which is reading um, like unfamiliar or very difficult uh, words. And we kind of see uh, even in, you know, a sort of neurotypical that they struggle with these tasks where the 
words are difficult um, or they're just unknown. And I wonder what that may tell you about at what part are um, people with AOS um, having difficulty in the either the repetition or the production of speech if you also see this um, with aging? Whoa, thank you for that question. I think um, that um, you are absolutely right, and I applaud you studying older adults. Um, this is not something we have been doing uh, in our lab, but the more we look into it and the more I read the literature and understand the literature, the more it's just very clear to me that when you give sufficient challenge to a neurotypical uh, nervous system and a neurotypical brain, they're also going to struggle. And they're not going to struggle in vastly different ways than um, our patients who are producing speech with not intact um, circuitry for, for speech production. Um, as you age, um, there is likely to be um, uh, more sensitivity to complexity uh, for, for lots of reasons. Um, some of it for motor reasons, but also for, for cognitive reason, reasons and, and resource allocation uh, reasons um, where um, um, you, you trip up. Um, I will just mention the, the studies, for example, uh, using tongue twister paradigms. Like if you have ever, um, you know, try to beat yourself on a, on a tongue twister uh, uh, task, you know that it takes quite a bit of, uh, of effort and you um, have to use, um, you have to use tricks um, to be successful. Uh, and yet you're, you're end up making both phonological and distortion errors. I'll ask a quick question. I really found the project interesting where you looked at accuracy over time after the participant said the same word multiple times. I didn't catch if um, any of the subgroups had dysarthria as well, or was it just apraxy speech versus apraxy speech with aphasia versus aphasia only? Yes, great question. So um, we always, um, um, well, so far we have uh, for the most part, looked at stroke. And this study was a stroke uh, cohort. And we always screen um, for, uh, for dysarthria as best we can. So uh, just looking at what we can do on a face-to-face -face evaluation and what we hear in their, in their um, speech output. Granted, I still feel like we're missing really mild dysarthria and it's difficult it's difficult to know what to what extent a, a really mild dysarthria coexists with these stroke patients. But I would say compared to, you know, like the rest of the literature and all of the studies we've done, they had no dysarthria, like no or minimal dysarthria. These were people who only had apraxia of speech and aphasia. Interestingly, I didn't mention this in the interest of time, but we also looked at people with aphasia with phonemic uh, paraphasia and they were not as distorted, but they were they they also produced distortions. And again, this is something that we see um, in the acoustic literature. Um, there is are these subclinical, you know, uh, motor programming or motor planning or motor something issues in folks who don't have a motor pro programming or uh, planning disorder, and that includes neurotypical adults. Um, so. It's really, I think, an interesting continuum um, for us to explore uh, with a finer grain of detail. I think like by substituting these very gross, very um, um, categorical distinctions in our sophisticated analysis um, and theory development with more fine grained uh, measures and accepting that there's a continuum between this um, disorder and not disorder that's um, interacting with complexity. We can build much better models and understand brain behavior relationships with a much finer grain of um, detail. I just had a, one more question. Um, at the beginning, when you had the different raters, I was wondering what your thoughts in the clinical world were on um, if you didn't have the possibility of having probably 
in, in, in it, which I think for most clinicians, they are have a forced choice of yes or no. Would they have been, do you think they would have been more similar? Have there been studies that you've done that was a forced choice? Um, and in the clinical world, do you think that people are, like if they're in the probably that clinicians lean towards, yes, let's diagnose them so that they can get the treatment? Or do you think that there's a, you know, a lack of resources where they would uh, you know, waver and say, no, we don't have enough resources to, to give treatment to all of these uh, individuals um, for that? Mm. Okay, so uh, there are many, many aspects uh, of that question, uh, and it's a really good question. Uh, first of all, I think personality makes uh, plays a part here. Um, so how we, um, some people are, um, more inclined to, to take a risk and go with a diagnosis and others are less so inclined. They, they want to have strong evidence uh, for doing this. Had we asked our three expert raters, um, to only use a, uh, two-way distinction, um, two of them would have been in better agreement with each other. Uh, because there was one who, um, who who went with probably when the other one went with for sure, um, and they would have been in more agreement with the other. Um, the third um, raider would not have been in agreement uh, with the second uh, raider had we used only a two category distinction. Um, it really depends. It really depends on where in your mind um, do you set that um, distinction between what is normal and what is abnormal um, as far as um, these um, uh, diagnostic features are concerned. Um, so in clinical practice, uh, I um, am learning from my colleagues in, in clinical practice that they really don't like to make this diagnosis. <laughs> and they are often confused with the criteria. Uh, they don't really know how to apply them. They don't really know how to interpret them. Uh, and uh, they uh, often um, will, will avoid. So I think that if we can provide a um, quantitative measures, so just like we get quantitative lab results of our, our blood um, uh, analysis, we can get quantitative analysis of our speech output uh, through a combination of outsourcing and um, automation, then they have something on paper that they can interpret. Like they have quantitative data that they can interpret and then giving them the option to say, this is a good profile of apraxia of speech. Much like we say, this is a prototypical profile of, you know, Broca's aphasia, for example. But this patient is more mixed and it's not as certain. Um, so we need to follow over time, for example, or we need to, we are accepting that this is more of a mixed presentation. I think that will go a long, long way um, to improve clinical practice, both in terms of diagnostics and in terms of treatment planning and intervention planning. Anything else from our group here? Nothing. All right. Okay, Katrina. Lisa had to leave a little bit early, so I'm taking over. Uh, we have no more questions from our group here uh, uh, in the in the room. I did try to kick off the question session in the chat box with two questions, but uh, all you get from the other audience is uh, uh, compliments. So uh, Peter Trickletop says, thanks, that was great summary of your important work. And Harris to, to Mr. Cleos also says, thank you so much, Katrina. So I did have two questions, if you don't mind. Um, so on that observation that speakers with uh, apraxia tend to make more phonemic paraphasias than speakers with aphasia and phonemic paraphasias, um, is it possible that, the, the, that some circularity may be at play there where uh, people with very mild apraxia speech may be underdiagnosed and may be mistaken for having aphasia with phonemic paraphasias, whereas maybe speakers with a very severe case of phonemic paraphasias in aphasia may be mistaken for having a praxia of speech and therefore the misdiagnosis, uh, the misdiagnosis may account for that difference somewhat. What do you think? I do think that that can be the case. You know, we're always in the circle. Like it's like, it's just, um, 
how are we going to get out of the circle? We have to start quantifying some things to, um, to, to look for patterns. So if you are using um, quantitative cutoffs, and you're using like we do, we operationalize distortions and uh, word prosodic impairments. Um, we're we're deciding what's abnormal, and um, it's going to um, probably miss some of the milder cases. So, for example, the study from um, that we did with Wamba's lab, we were um, measuring word syllable duration for these people who were diagnosed clinically with mild. Um, uh, apraxia of speech, and though most of them fell above our cutoff for what we would cons be con cons considered to be abnormal, some were in the normal range. Um, so this, I think, is an interesting question. I wouldn't necessarily say that, are we missing the sum because we have uh, rigid criteria, but I would say, are we not really understanding what is going on? <laughs> like, what is motor programming? What is motor planning? Like, and what are the, the categories that go together? Uh, uh, so I don't know if this makes sense to you uh, in terms of my answer, but my answer would be that, yes, I agree with you. I think we're missing stuff. I, the the apraxia of speech, you know, range from very mild to very severe. It's so heterogeneous. Um, that um, it's difficult at both ends to diagnose. So we may very well be missing, but we don't know what we're missing. <laughs> we don't know what the, what what is accurate. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. My second question, I think, I fear maybe too big for just a, a, a short answer. But if you you know if you want to give some thoughts, that'd be great. If you're saying, well, that's just too much, we want to end this right here, that's also fine. My question was, <laughs> what are your thoughts on the evidence base for differential intervention methods for apraxia versus severe phonemic paraphasia, right? Because that's ultimately why we're doing this, why we want to know the difference. So, and if there is a good evidence for how different approaches may work, then could a brief intervention method maybe serve to confirm a differential diagnosis, right? So if someone responds to a particular type of treatment, does that? serve to uh, yes exactly <laughs> that's exactly I, I totally agree with this and this is what my my comment here about dynamic assessment that maybe this is a really fruitful avenue you know, for for um, um future work it's really to look at um responsiveness to to, to queuing um uh, different types of queuing different types of treatment um uh, uh, conditions as for sure, uh, to help us with treatment planning, but also it can tell us about the underlying um, uh, etiology and the, and the diagnosis. So um, I totally, um, I, I very much agree with that. Um, and we are, um, we, we are in our lab looking at some of these different things about Q conditions. Um, what do I think about the treatment evidence for uh, phonemic paraphasia? What I think is that it is extremely sparse, and we need to uh, we need to look at whether different treatments matter, um, because diagnosing apraxia of speech, um, you know, like why are we doing it? To some extent, we may be doing it for diagnostic purposes, um, clinically, certainly theoretically, to build models. But clinically, ultimately, it is for um, for planning treatment, and so we need much stronger evidence uh, that people with apraxia of speech require benefit from different treatment methods um, than people who have aphasia with phonemic paraphasia. We assume that's the case, but we just really don't have that evidence yet. Great. Thanks so much. That brings us to the end of the of your presentation and the question ses session. Katrina, thanks so much for doing this today. We're, uh, that was a great talk. You get a lot of comments in the chat box here, people saying how, how they enjoyed your talk. Ellen Bernstein Ellis also says she appreciates the acknowledgement of the complexity involved in this diagnosis. So I think that was a very helpful talk for all of us. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to seeing our audience again um, in uh, two weeks when we'll be listening to Elena Barbieri. Um, good day. <laughs>